Welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. Fen. Croiso. And I will be your host, Alexis. We'll be talking about uh, Amun Ray, a legendary encounter aliens. And before that, uh, we'll mention two donor news in the uh, board game industry. Um, but before, uh, but first, we'll start with seeing how everyone is doing in the Stanley Catch Up. So, how have you been doing, Alessio? Oh, I thank you. I'm doing fine. <laughs> uh, I received my gambler's chest finally, so that's my only news. I basically got it. I it looks like the ninja who keeps slashing the boxes has spared mine because it's only superficially scratched so the, the inside box is perfectly fine I got the content from the visual check and by enumerating stuff it looks like there's everything the face on the beast hunter is uh, uh, just slightly melted, not that melted like uh, those posts in BGG. So Ooh, yeah. I have a question, right? So yeah. have you checked the bone eater? Uh, um, yeah, that because my bone eater is entirely missing the lower jaw on the skull. Okay, not yet. The, that, that's oh, well, you can tell me about that later. Then um, yeah. it's, it's one I noticed because my beast hunter face isn't melted, but my I, I discovered uh, the bone the survivor bone eater is missing the the lower jaw. It's meant to be like spine and jaw at, in his hand, and then you attach the skull on top. Yeah, so it looks a bit weird. unfortunately, so you rolled a ten, Alessio. There. Yeah, <laughs> I I actually uh, built the Crimson Croc. I built two scouts. I built the Smoke Singers. I think I'll just build the the the, the Bone Eaters actually, and uh, I think that I can start playing. So <laughs> hopefully I, I'll join the majority of people now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically me. What about you, Fen? I've uh, been um, very busy. Uh, I think the main thing is, originally I was going to talk about Marvel Champions Next Evolution, but um, I pre-ordered it and my delivery arrived and it wasn't in the delivery. Um, and I contacted the, uh -huh. my game store and they were like, oh, uh, we just changed systems and it doesn't automatically pull those kind of pre-orders to when you're making an order and i was like that seems like a bit of a, an issue how yeah. do i have to manually contact you whenever something comes into stock because like i've pre-ordered the next red rains with them for ashes um because those boss battlers are really good and um it's a what it, like here in sweden it, not a lot of stock for red rains comes over so um i'm a little worried that that's gonna um be a, a bit of a a scramble but hopefully i'm wrong and they'll have it uh, apart from that i've been um, wading my way through the gambler's chest and um our willow tree died so i had to cut that down which is a bit of a shame we had a little willow tree grown in the front garden and something i don't know what infected the top of it um and it just just died right during the summer um uh, so I had to cut it down to the stump and we'll see if the stump grows anymore or not. But yeah, it's a bit of a strange one. Um, yeah, that's autumn. Got to start clearing out all the the garden and everything. Uh, that's kind of it. How about you, Alexis? I hear you've been traveling. Yeah. Uh, so before the traveling part, uh, I've been uh, moving houses, which as I've mentioned in the last episode, I believe that I was on. Uh, it's it's been taking a while and it will probably take another couple of weeks, but uh, my new place is looking great. It has a lot more space to play board games and everything, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, and I am currently visiting Audrey. Uh, she's at work at the moment, so I'm just using a computer to record. Um, because we are doing a full-on weekend just playing the Gambler's Chest. Uh, we are going to do a massive <laughs> marathon. We did the prologue yesterday and uh, it's been very fun. Uh, we'll probably talk a lot more about the Gambler's Chest in the next episode or the episode after that. Uh, once uh, more members of the, um, the Last Standy have been able to play it. And I've been able to, to play uh, at least uh, two-thirds of the campaign. Um, 
but so far it's been very enjoyable. Uh, I think that we can definitely feel that Adam has um, polished the game more and uh, it shows a little bit more um, game designer uh, experience in this game. So that's very, uh, very nice. I'm pretty yeah. happy to see that. Uh, there is like a lot of complexity that feels just a bit too much, but every aspect taken by itself is like well designed and it feels good and it, it plays well and it adds some good stuff to the gameplay, but there's maybe a little bit too much of it. I don't know about that yet. It'll, I'll have to play more to, to get a feel of that, but so far that's my, my impression. But everything that i've touched is is very well made so yeah yeah it's the, one of the things i was uh, very adamant about is that if there's going to be this much of a delay before it's released it needs to be really good it'll never make up for the delay but i can say as well it is really good although there's a few oddities like uh we chatted a little bit about the philosophy deck issue where there's no rules for what you do with the philosophy deck and apparently um, from what I gathered, Adam doesn't really think there should be any rules to regard the philosophy deck, and he thinks shuffling the philosophy cards back in is a bit, is it's a bit of nonsense. Um, is what what I heard from somebody else. So that might not be Adam's actual words, but when I asked him about it, he didn't respond to me at all. Um, so, so which is what, a bit of an issue. What's the? How is it supposed to be played? Right, uh, there isn't any rules. Right, if oh, you look okay, through yeah. the philosophy section, there's no rule. There's yeah, yeah. a rule for setting up the deck, and well, you randomise the deck then. But there's no rules for how you use the deck once it's set up. The, um, and the way that and I um, understood it is that when you draw a philosophy, you mark it down and then you shuffle it back into. The yeah, deck. that that's the bit that Adam says was in, a bit incredulous about, according to this um, third party. Okay. So yeah, and and. Um, that I was perfectly happy to just shuffle back stuff back in, but then I reached the point where one of the f knowledges had Allows one of the philosophies the deck, ordered yeah. the deck for me, and I'm like, when does the deck stop being ordered? Because well, if it's immediately, then that's a useless ordering ability. It should just say choose the next there one has philosophy. To be a little bit of putism into the gambler's chest. Uh, yeah, otherwise, of I would have been surprised. Yeah, yeah, and there's a there's a couple of other bits and pieces where things are. Um, could have been a bit tighter, but the actual design mechanics and the experience is is very, uh, very good. Um, if only, um, if only I didn't keep cutting all of the decks to the uh, new cards constantly. That's yeah. um, it's a huge, it's a big problem. Um, I've got new sleeves due to pick up today that will hopefully help address that. But even now, I was just sitting there and just shuffling. And I was like, okay, well, now I know why I've not seen the Bone Hunters because I cut them to the top of the deck all the time and I deal from the bottom of the hunt deck because my hunt cards are all heavily marked because they've got six different shades of brown on the back. So Yeah, KDM yeah. Uh, has always been the sort of game where I feel like I would rather just use an app to shuffle and draw cards because there's so many cards that you can, like... Uh, record and, and um, add from expansions and that don't have the same card stock that just uh, an app like the, the scribe feels so much easier yeah. to to use so that's a bit of a shame but yeah it's um that's that's the other thing which i've got to play through properly and we'll get off kdm in a moment but uh, the bone eaters for me have only just they're upstairs now finally on an encounter board at level one and I've been killing level three node one monsters before they turned up. So they're going to get <laughs> wrecked. Like, I, I feel like maybe the game needed a system to put the encounters in by a certain time. There are some systems to ensure you don't encounter them too early. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's, bit, it's, it's a bit weird that you can't, uh, that, that it's random. Just the same way with uh, Atmas. Um, yeah. It should get better with more encounters in it, but they feel like the lonely tree where you just stick them in all the time and go, maybe they turn up, yeah. maybe not. Um, but they don't, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I, I definitely looking forward to fighting them, though, even if it's going to be a very brutal lesson from me to them. <laughs> Yeah, speaking about brutal lesson, oh, that's a good way to switch topics. Uh, <laughs> there's been a couple of really uh, bummer news in the industry uh, recently that uh, we feel we 
would it would be interesting to to talk about and to mention especially since they have been uh well one of them has been uh, extremely badly um uh, uh shared uh in around and that's kind of the the topic that we want to talk about so uh should we start with uh Noel's bard or with unity i think let's start with unity because i'm interested to see what alessio has to say about that. yeah finally so. my job comes handy yeah <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, news about Unity. Uh, first, let's say, let's tell uh, everyone what is Unity, actually. Unity is a software platform, a framework is called, uh, which allows you to make 3D games, basically. Uh, it's a very easy to use platform because it, uses, it leverages, uh, it abstracts a lot of complexity that is required to... Uh, make 3D games, it's a very uh, mature engine with a lot of stuff added to it and uh, it has the, the specific advantage of being uh, very fast to market. Uh, that yeah. means that, yeah. Uh, j just to add, it's also like uh, used a lot by new uh, developers because it's a step above uh, Kiddy's engine or like um... Uh, Godot or Game Maker's Kit or uh, whichever uh, Unity is like closer to Unreal in it, the capabilities that it has, and it also has access to an asset store that allows you to uh, use system already made wholesale by by other devs. So you can, if you need, for example, a safe system, you can you can just use something that has been already made a hundred times. So that saves a lot of um, work hours for smaller studios. So it's been like extremely popular and it's kind of one of the uh, main fuel of the uh, sort of uh, revival of uh, indie video games that has been uh, happening for the past like 10 years ish uh, but that might change in the next year uh, right Alessio? Yeah exactly uh, like you said uh, there are basically two competitors in the world of engines they are Unity and Unreal Engine uh, they are both uh, in a solid position with their uh, faithful user base and uh, they are both uh, in the, at this right, precise moment uh, requiring a bit of money now what uh, uh, this brings us to say what decided Unity to do to make some money. Uh, they basically decided that starting January 1st of 2024, they will charge developers. So the one, let's say, making or publishing the content, not the end users, for, uh, let's say, in the worst case scenario, 20 cents for each new installation of every game developed with Unity. That means, uh, think that you make an Android app, with a game, you give out for free with Unity, and 100 people install it, you get charged with uh, $20 by Unity, for these new installations, whenever it happens. So, new installs, uh, they said uh, new installs, that means uh, that on a phone platform they could probably uh, define per account, but on a computer they will probably uh, have a per machine metric, meaning a lot more. And especially, this is especially wrong because it rewards... Actually, it not rewards piracy, but it makes you suffer even more with an actual loss of money for piracy. Because if a pirated copy gets installed, I guess uh, the, the, the current version of the frequently asked questions is that uh, Unity will charge you for that. So that... Uh, uh, just think about the scenarios, they, they are basically unsustainable and uh, the world of uh, game publishing and developing is actually revol uh, uh, in a revolution against it because, uh, uh, yeah, uh, basically th there has been a colossal backlash. It's uh, comparable to what uh, Wizard of the Coast did with D&D uh, content creators uh, last year. And, uh, yeah, we, it's extremely yeah. similar. It, yeah. it feels like the same sort of um, 
very uh, I don't know a blind move that feel like it, it isn't aware of what the customer want or what the people uh, feel like and there's a very specific reason of that that sort of a yeah uh, move is because of uh, uh, John uh, wish he wish it yellow the that, I, I, yeah if you go with the uh, Italian American pronunciation it's John Ricciello and is uh, the CEO of Unity currently, but but he was it used to be uh, he, he was the he's the one who came up with this idea, so smart idea really. And uh, the... he's he's um he he was in EA, wasn't he? Yeah, so, exactly. He, he was the guy who started talking about charging players per bullet. Yeah, in, the game. <laughs> in, in Battlefield Absolute, or something. Just yeah, a, just a capitalist, like a real proper capitalist. When I, and I'm using that as an insult here. And, and more to that, it feels like he has no idea about what video games are, and that he just has this position, and he knows that there are customers that have wallets, and he's just trying to figure out how to part uh, people with their money and that's yeah but but the, thing that he, he the, thinks the, about this is I, I'm su sure suicidal yeah. yeah this is suicidal on a whole new level because it's not targeting end users for, for which you yeah. would get just less revenue because less people will buy your game it's targeting developers which means I everyone will start using another platform but yeah, it's I, also I don't, think, it, yeah. I, I don't think that he's uh he cares too much about the whole societal id because w what he wants is to make more money for the the shareholders yeah it's probably going to make them a lot of money in the short term and then the company is going to burn but by the time uh, that guy will be walking in uh, greener pastures yeah that's, that's unfortunately what the kind of um uh, this kind of company kind of just begs for because that's that's how capitalism works to you know burn burn them all and just amass as much money as you can the, in the meantime that's how uber functions in yeah every you, you... companies and it kind of sucks because uh this this will have a big impact on a lot of developers because for a long time uh like switching engine is not easy like new Be developers that people, are just starting on a project yeah uh, people uh, develop the expertise over years and they are yeah. just throwing it away uh, and, but... and often, like even if you are able to port your entire game onto uh, something different, like if if it's if they manage to do it, it will not be uh, optimized for it. And it, you might actually lose uh, uh, and control all the bugs, lose a lot of performance, and it's just going to be costly for uh, developers to do that. And I'm pretty sure that uh, enough developers are going to stay on Unity for a while. To make it a worthwhile decision, despite uh, killing Unity's reputation forever, because even if they revert back, why would you keep working with Unity if, at any point, they might decide to fuck you over? Yeah. Now, now uh, if I if I just take the the apps and programs I have sitting on my desk right now, uh, how does this impact board games? Well, Kingdom Death Simulator is written in Unity. Marvel, yeah. Marvel Snap is written in Unity. Root is written in Unity. Dire Wolf Digital Apps, every single yeah. one of those is written in Unity. Mindbug App, which is not yet released, is written in Unity. So, yep. uh, Everdell, Unity. <laughs> yeah, po <Yeah>. possibly. <laughs> and while yeah. this, this probably won't impact uh, Marvel Snap, because it's a massive company, so they might just uh, decide to ignore the, the fee per install. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, all the devs are going to have a very hard time. Like, maybe the people that are making Root might realize that it's probably not. Eon Trespass Odyssey but... official exactly. app is written in Unity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In any case, that's uh, pretty dire news for the video game business, and uh, tangentially for the board game and yeah, yeah. yeah for all supporting apps and digital implementations i think even spirit island i think is in unity as well it's um it's like uh, it's a real shame and it doesn't matter what happens out of this um unit the trust in unity is now gone and people are going to start looking elsewhere <laughs> anyway uh they could begin using a real engine but the real trouble with this is that you uh, 
uh, it's technical but Unreal Engine is based on C++ while Unity is based on C Sharp uh, they will have a rough time searching for alternatives so uh, of course uh, when a door closes an opportunity arises so probably there will be people we need to fill in and we will see of course uh, uh, if we are given past performance as an indicator, it could happen like with Wizards of the Coast, where they will just uh, may take a massive step back and end up worse than they started with. People will still jump ship, even if they refuse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, anyway, uh, the, the, the outlook is uh, not exactly happy about, uh, for this one. So... Uh, I, well, I, it's definitely happier than our next topic. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. That I, since I know what is next next topic, I hope that we, we can do a many tights to this. Uh, can we have the, the, the next bad news in a way that it doesn't sound that bad? No, <laughs> not at all. No. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Fan, do you want to, to take this one then? Yeah, I'll start. So... Um, uh, Many of you probably are aware of No Rolls Bard, um, a board gaming channel that has taken the Will Wheaton tabletop formula of a high production board game with talking head interviews uh, during it to help like explain people's uh, thoughts. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's grown very large. It like, picked up during the pandemic and became pretty big um, over this past like few months though there's been rumblings of things not being um uh, as great behind the scenes uh, as it really should be so i'm gonna like the the main individual this all revolves around is the um incredibly charismatic adam blompier um and we're gonna follow his little journey and we're just gonna um uh, talk about what's happened um and at the end of it, a little bit of position on what we think that um, No Rolls Bard and their parent company really should have done and should do going ahead because um, it's it, it's a it's pretty like it's not great at all. Um, so uh, Adam Blompier is a improvisational comedian um, and a like very quick witted individual. Um, and he became a bit of an internet uh, celebrity um, on YouTube as like, you know, a YouTube content creator as a part of what culture we're talking like pre 2017. Uh, she's where he also did um, sketch comedy and he was involved in the foundation of a UK wrestling company. Um, he's also the, and he, like what culture was this kind of big thing at the time and it's really helped the UK interest in wrestling. Um, to, to develop, and I think it's a big part of the UK wrestling scene, uh, yeah. or at least it was. Um, so then in 2017, some of the founding members of What Culture announced a channel called Cultaholic. Um, I'm not going to list all the names, but Adam Blompier is amongst those people, and this is going to be a dedicated wrestling channel. And literally, before they even get round to releasing any videos, it comes out that Adam Blompier was um, soliciting nude photos from fans. Um, and he was removed from their coming upcoming channel roster. He never even appeared in a single one of their um, their recordings. So um, it's worth saying, first of all, nothing. There wasn't anything illegal in regards to what he was doing here. It's definitely skeevy, even by his own words. Um, he acknowledged it as being wrong. Uh, he was in a relationship um, with someone at the time and claimed to these other women that he was in an open relationship and it was okay and. Um, etc. So in he, he stepped away and he said that he had a problem and he needed to get help for it. He took responsibility of what um, what he did, which you know you you got to commend somebody who does at least take responsibility for what they did. Yeah, it was very mature yeah. at the at the time. Yeah. Yeah, he wrote an independent article which um, is meant to be like an apology and highlighting why um, you know like why it was good he got called out and how he's going to be a better person. I've got to be honest, 
some of it there now reading in hindsight there's there's still some warning signs yeah but anyway he stepped away in uh, in 2018 and spent time to get help and to reassess everything and then in 2020 uh, he appears uh, via a guest spot on a channel called Wrestle Talk, which is run by Ollie Davis, who is the CEO or COE, CEO, um, yeah, CEO of a fairly big UK YouTube company called Trident Digital Media. Um, and so he has this guest slot where he talks about how you do fantasy bookings and, I, and um, it goes down very well. People are very happy to see Adam back because, as I said, he is he is charismatic. He's comfortable on the camera. He he likes to. He's a big personality. Um, he he enjoys the celebrity of being a content creator um, as well as being one. So um, he's he's welcomed back by the community. Some of his fans have never really kind of left him. Um, and for myself, when he came back, I was like, OK, you know, what is the point in somebody apologising and say they'll do better if you don't give them a chance? Because otherwise they may as well just keep doing it. It's like punishment needs to be a proportional and there needs to be a chance for, um, you know, re-education, reintegration to society and all of that kind of stuff. What's what is the point in punishing someone um, if you're just going to keep punishing them forever? Yeah, so uh, many of us uh, welcomed him back into the community um, for myself. He came back on my radar. I was vaguely aware of him beforehand, but he came back on my radar with um, Parts Fun Known and specifically No Rolls Barred, which grew out of his own personal channel, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. He's the, at the centre of it. He's so. head of the channel, yes. yeah. Yeah, he's channel, channel director, yeah. Um, so, uh, no rolls barred, like really benefits from the pandemic in many ways because people are isolated and they, no rolls barred shows, they have board game club and they show a way of like playing various games together online. Um, and eventually that results in a little, uh, like a partnership with drafts board game club. Um, I have heard through the grapevine uh, that Adam was a manager in drafts at one point. I can't say for certain if that's true, but I wouldn't. I would I mean, assume Adam um, certainly had connections and everything. Uh, and it seems like a lot of the people he's brought into Noel's Bar are people he has personal connections or business connections with. Yeah, it, so. it seems like a group made out of friends rather than than specifically a business one. Like it, it seemed to be kind of a uh, something close knitted. Yeah, yeah. So the big thing that happens is um, Ben Burns, uh, the community EU community manager for the Pandemonium Institute, which is the company that made uh, Blood on the Clock Tower. Uh, he like contacts Adam and says, "Hey, would you like me to run some games for you guys?" Um, and you know, I'll story tell him, and you can all play. And this is this is like a meteoric moment for both No Rolls Bard and the Pandemonium Institute, because both sides really benefit. Um, the Pandemonium Institute now streams multiple times a week. There's always, there's like Blood on the Clock Tower on Twitch nearly every day um, yeah. from various different channels. Huge community of really w lovely, wonderful, welcoming people who um, are a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, so coming into that is the is Carly Reinhardt, who is uh, from Gnarly Carly Gaming, and she becomes a bit of a regular guest on their Blood on the Clock Tower videos. When they do recordings in person, Carly is um, present for them, and she does a few board game club No Rolls Barred recordings as well with them. Um, Carly is a is a really great small content creator. Like I watch her videos, um, and she's very enjoyable. She's very smart uh, and a very good player, especially of social deduction games. So anyway... Um, no Rolls Barred kick, do their second Kickstarter for doing another season of in-person stuff. And um, Carly's involvement kind of just disappears. And people, of course, start speculating about it. And eventually on one of her videos, um, unfortunately one where she's talking about an entirely different game that's launched on Kickstarter, somebody asks uh, when you're going to do some more videos in No Rolls Barred, and that's when she um, issues some allegations, first of all in a kind of vague-ish fashion, but eventually naming Adam through them, 
uh, saying that um, past behaviours are being repeated. So again, we don't know exactly what she is accusing Adam of, um, and we won't find out until due process has occurred because of UK privacy law, um, and we might not even find out then. We don't know, and that's why Carly hasn't directly said um, beyond she said that um, some some abuses was going on and that the system there was kind of protecting um, Adam and uh, that she felt other people like she, because of their associations with Adam and the way that they were towards what he was doing that she wasn't comfortable uh, spending like time working with them anymore because she felt their ethics didn't align with hers. Yeah. So that floats around for quite a while and no rules barred say nothing. Nothing at all. And then Adam disappears from the Norals Bard videos. Uh, not unheard of, you know, it's a rotating cast, sometimes people go on holiday, but the absence elongates and elongates and, and nobody's and saying was, anything. It was one of the main phase and very much like the... Not the main attraction, but but like... Yeah. He, he, he was he, like he, the part of the, the spirit the of the channel. He, he's the channel director, he was the, the lead host, he was the primary host, um... And he was the constant who was in most of the videos. Yeah, yeah. So he just disappeared. And he disappeared from, um, like, uh, parts of Unknown and Wrestle Talk as well. And, of course, initially it was kind of referenced to him being on holiday. Um, and eventually, via their Patreon, No Rolls Bard and one would assume the other patrons as well, I've not checked those, announced that he'd been placed on... Um, disciplinary leave while some investigations are being taken uh, by an independent HR company which you know is is kind of the way it should be um, done uh, you know the the independent HR company not the announcement via patreon but we'll talk about why I have a problem with that uh, in a short while anyway so um, at this point Matt Lees of shut up and sit down uh, does what those guys do best which is does a little bit of um, gaming related journalism and, and looks around and finds out that No Rules Bard is owned by Trident Digital Media and Trident Digital Media has two company directors, Ollie Davis, who has appeared on No Rules Bard videos, and a man called uh, Alex Spiller, who um, used to wrestle under the name Alex Shane until some very serious allegations of, of predation came out about him during the Speaking Out and Me Too movement. Um, He's never appeared on any videos, but he was listed as a company director until very recently, and he seems to still be listed as a shareholder for for T, uh, TDM. Yeah, yeah. It's so, um, company, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. So, with, with all of this stuff that Matt went through, um, uh, Ollie has reached out to Matt um, to talk about that. I just wanted to say that, but go ahead, Alexis. I just wanted to mention that Alex Shane had. Uh very much a worse history uh, in uh, in wrestling he was known to have um, like uh, I, I, if I remember correctly uh, abused one of his partners and he was like known to be a piece of shit and people didn't want it to work with him so um, while uh, Adam Blampier we, we still don't know like the full uh, length of allegation and everything. Uh, Alex Shane, uh, things are a lot more uh, solid and credible, and uh, that that person should not be in, this, in the, the industry at all, and has never shown any kind of uh, getting better. They just every time that he made something that was a problem, instead he just went quiet for a few months or a couple of years while still. Uh, benefiting from uh, the companies uh, that he is working for and with, so good to good yeah. to know that this this person is a kind of a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's definitely some very bad stuff around um, Adam Shane uh, that was talked about during the speaking out movement. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was uh, very shocked when I saw that Matt Lees had um, gone to company's house in the UK, you know, the site and checked who the company directors were and found this particular individual being there. Uh, now, he's of note because obviously he seems to be a, at least was financially involved. Um, and the suggestion is he still is in some manner. Um, but the really like 
um, thing that made me want to talk about this and even mention him is um, on September 12th, uh, Adam Blompier was announced to be stepping down and away from No Rules Bard and leaving the company. Um, he he got to make his statement on his personal Instagram, which is way more higher profile than than just on a Patreon post somewhere. Because, you know, you've got... I mean, the Patreon post was made open and the one saying that Adam stepped away was also made openly. But it's kind of like um, No Rules Bard are just talking to their most um, devoted fans which yeah. that's yeah. like the, the, and the reaction there like there's a lot of people with some positivity and i do i'm i've seen carly take some fire from people um over what she said um, yeah if which, they, you know. they talk specifically for uh with fans that's how it's going to happen if they post a, a message on their patreon even if they make it open to the public people don't check the patreons and sell unless they are patrons if yeah. they yeah we know <laughs> Instagram or Twitter, people would be able to retweet and to comment on it and to share it. Uh, it would have been a way better move, or even if yeah. they simply uh, contacted a proper uh, news company to, to have a, a statement made public yeah. like in the industry or went through any number of channels that wasn't their uh, own personal little fiefdom. Yeah, well, um, I was going to talk about this near the end, but it seems like oh, a right point yeah. to talk about it now. Um, is Well, first of all, uh, Adam departs on September 12th, and this is the same day that Alex is removed as company director, and that, that Adam's publicly stepped away and been given the chance to provide his story, which, um, uh, if I'm honest, it, he's painted himself in the best possible light he could do. I don't know if that's a true light or not. Um, I, I can't say. Uh, because we don't know because due process has been followed so um, if my position is treat the victims and the claims as credible um, but you know listen to the due process you know and if somebody is found to be absolved or clear uh, then you know you, you have to it's, it's only right to accept that but as I say Victims need to be taken seriously and allegations like this need to be looked at seriously. It seems like that much is happening. But anyway, uh, for my position, I genuinely think that Ollie should have recorded a video um, stating that the, you know, the situation in corporate speak, of course, because that's what you'd expect from a company, of saying this, this, this and this and this is happening right now. And that should have been posted on every single one of the channels well ahead of anything else happening, because it seems very clear that already stuff was occurring regarding to Adam long before yeah. Carly started to speak publicly about what was going on or what had happened. Ways to, to protect him and to make sure that things would be all right. And that feels like, uh, I don't know, that, that feels like putting too much care into someone that might be uh, uh, not a victim, but uh, uh, an abuser here. Yeah, it, it may be, yes, yes, allegedly. Um, so allegedly, uh, ultimately, yes. yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about because Matt Lees is apparently going to be meeting with Ollie Davis and honestly, um, like it, apparently the conversation to be how to help and protect people within the industry. Well, Ollie's certainly going to have to step up um, a great deal for this because, you know, his brand is now um, tarred quite heavily and he needs to be quite transparent about what uh, what's going on. And if he's not going to talk about... Alex Shane slash spilling as well, then, um, you know, that's like, come on, dude. Uh, so I wanted to talk about it here, um, even though it's a bit kind of like sad and heavy compared to what we normally talk about, because it, these kind of things do need to be talked about, like issues with the gaming goat in the past and, and stuff like that. It, yeah. And uh, Broken Token, um, they need to be talked about uh, because we can't let the board gaming industry and the tabletop role playing ga industry end up like the video game industry um, <laughs> <laughs> with what's yeah. like, you know there's some really bad stuff that's come out for the video game industry in recent times as well and no 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 yeah so, the, the the best possible outcome is just that justice is served and uh, for us as people uh, probably the, the the lesson we can carry with us is that we should never blame the victim anyway alleged or true or whatever uh, when someone decides to point a finger uh, let let justice do its course but never take on the victim 
and yeah. the other. I, I just like yeah. to yeah yeah. I just like to say like just to, tangentially to that. In the UK, approximately two percent of al- allegations to of this nature turn out to be false. Nearly sixty odd percent of them are not reported at all. Like that that so the fact that some people do get falsely accused for whatever reason um yeah that can happen that really sucks uh hopefully it's it, you know we can get to a place where if those kind of allegations like the people with those kind of allegations are you know shamed and dealt with in that in appropriately not shamed isn't the right word but you know what i mean but ultimately we need to give victims the space and place to be feel that they can step forward and say this has happened to me and it's not okay and i need someone to do something about it and not have people turn on them and make it make them feel bad for talking about it because otherwise we're just sweeping under the rug so many victims yeah let's just basically yeah. have the have fun with games and not uh, take them as a way to just rage at someone i mean in any case, like any victim that steps forward is going to uh, first have to uh, live through uh, that trauma again because it becomes like a, a talking point onto the greater public. Uh, they're also going to have to deal with uh, fans attacking them uh, in response. They have going to they will have to deal with uh, a lot of shit. So we can definitely try to make sure that on top of that they don't have the to be we, we can try to to diminish that and to make sure that they are you know treated with credibility and with respect because that's the most important thing but i think that's on uh, beyond what's uh, happening with uh, adam and alex chain and the the whole uh, non roll belt uh, thing uh, what we can, what we should really look into is simply the way that they've uh, treated that information. Uh, announcing it in your personal Patreon is uh, really not a good way to deal with it. And unfortunately, the the board game industry is not yet big enough or serious enough to have the proper channels to to report that kind of thing to to be able to to talk about this. And uh, it would be really good if we had a better way to to approach those sort of things um the yeah that that's that's a a big issue especially with small-ish companies that are mostly made out of friends that have been uh you know that that weren't that public before then because of a streak of luck and like the being at the right place at the right time and having the the right uh the right charisma they can suddenly have millions of fans that have a very um uh, what's the term again for like, parasocial uh, yeah parasocial relationship with uh with the people uh that can create a lot of really uh, risky situations uh for for people and and can be really unsafe for for a lot of people uh the Outside of board gaming, simply, but uh, the YouTuber scene is full of uh, abusers that have used their communities to, as uh, their personal, uh, to use a lure term, hunting ground uh, for gr- uh, grooming people. I I've, I know a couple of uh, people that have been through uh, something similar. So it's really something that we should look after because uh, anywhere that is going to be uh, fame and 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 money and uh, responsibility of our community uh, there needs to be safeguards uh, put in place so, yeah, yeah yeah so um, I think we need to put a button on this topic yeah, here but yeah. I'm, I'll f- finish with first of all when there are like um, official statements from Trident or No Rules Bard or Ollie Davis uh, I'll touch on them in a future episode to like not just to leave this hanging um, and and you know to close it out uh, properly um and i'd also like to say if you are curious for a like good timeline there's a youtuber who does like what happened to's called alan spicer he's done a few videos summarizing the whole thing that's happened and following a bunch of like the the public situation and the timeline uh is very helpful the way he's ordered everything so uh, there's somewhere you can look for a fairly like flat and um, uh, Ma- honest look matt lee's uh, has been talking a lot about it on twitter too yeah 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 he has yeah all right
would you like to start Alessio by talking to us about Amon Ray? Why not? So, Amon Ray. Uh, or whatever, Amon Ray. Okay, let's go uh, with the transliteration of the Egyptian name. I hope it's pronounced well. But anyway, it's the Knizia game. Uh, it, it's... Uh, it's originally published by, I think, Cosmos in 2003, and it went out with a 20th anniversary edition published by Alicat Games. It was done through a crowdfunding campaign. It's delivering right now, and it's available retail. Uh, you can get Emore, and it has also a few expansions in this new campaign, but there is more than enough value in the base game alone, and we will talk about it now. Uh, now, uh, disclaimer, I am a long-time Knizia fan, and uh, be if we uh, go back... No, yeah, surely not. Yeah. <laughs> this is news to me. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, take your time to digest this news. So, anyway, uh, it goes back to 2005 or so. Uh, there were a few board games and even few board games around, modern board games, translated in Italian. So, basically, I played a lot of Settlers of Catan, I played a lot of Ticket to Ride, and when people was a bit more proficient in games, we played a lot of Amore. Uh, this means that I will review the 20th anniversary edition, but uh, I have a lot of experience with the original game, which is basically the same. I will highlight the differences, uh, but you will forgive me since a few rules have been simplified if I use references to the old rule sets. That being said, uh, Amore, what is Amore? Uh, you know Rene Knizia to be famous mostly for uh, two kind of games, he, actually a lot. He made uh, more than 600 games and he boss that record, but uh, uh, his most famous production are tie lane games, and these are the one like Samurai or Tigris and Euphrates or uh, Yellow and Yangtze or Through the Desert or Babylonia and so on and is famous for having revolutionized the genre of auction games. And uh, while I love my Thailand games, I have to say that uh, Knizia auction games are basically the foundation and the inspiration to all auction games that exist now. Uh, I uh, Amore falls in this latter category, so it's important because of that. It's a worker placement game with two different auction systems in within it. Uh, it plays in 90 minutes. He, the original game was meant to be played by three to five players, and uh, the new edition adds uh, two, player, uh, two player rules. Uh, the beautiful part about this game is that it scales upward perfectly. It, uh, is even more interesting to play in five players, but it's uh, more than challenging and, and fun to have in three or four players. So it's uh, uh, one example of why the auction mechanic uh, works perfectly with the game. Now, uh, in Amore, you are basically the viziers of the royal fam family of pharaohs in uh, ancient Egypt, and uh, you will go through two eras, so the old kingdom and the new kingdom, and you will play uh, to basically place pyramids, uh, gain influence, and so on, basically to gain victory points. Uh, who scores victory points at the end of the game, uh, who scores the most victory points at the end of the game, wins. That's basically it. Uh, as you can see, the base mechanic is that you will go through an old kingdom era, where you will play three turns, make partial scoring at the end of the third turn, and uh, then you will partially reset the board, exactly like it happens in brass games, and uh, everything will be up for play again, and you will go through the second part of the New Kingdom, and at the end of the New Kingdom you will do the complete scoring, who has the most points wins. How is played 
it's pretty easy. Basically, uh, you go through uh, four phases, it has been simplified, and uh, you repeat uh, the four phases of a turn three times before scoring. This is it. The first phase is the auction, and uh, you have a table with 15 provinces, uh, which are all the land uh, around the Nile. Every time you will uh, draw randomly a number of provinces equal to the number of players. And then each player, starting from the first player, will set their bidding stone on a number on the province, which is the amount of money they want to bid on that province. Now, uh, how it happens, the first player takes the first uh, province, possibly the most interesting to him, and sets a price, let's say three gold. Uh, after that, the new player can decide to either outbid the original player on the province he, he, he chose, or to uh, bid on a different province, and so on, until all uh, provinces are uh, filled with, one, with exactly one stone. There are four players, there are four provinces, for instance. Uh, when this happens, everyone gets their province, and uh, pay the money for the money they bid and that's it uh, why this is beautiful because of how you are outbid when you are outbid you get back your stone and you must place it on a different province you cannot place it back to outbid the original player so uh, basically you end up picking another province possibly outbidding someone else being there in the meantime which gets another to outbid to get uh, an outbid somewhere else, and so on. And this is pretty smart because it allows you uh, both to do a kind of constrained bidding, which is uh, beautiful and fun to play because it's extremely competitive and you can get a lot in the way of each other. And you can mostly, uh, with a bit of expertise, you can... Uh, uh, make other players bid a lot more than what is worth. Uh, it is important because each province has a power. Uh, they can give you an immediate benefit, for instance, immediate money or immediate resources or so on. They can have slots to, to place workers on. And when you place workers, farmers, you basically will get more money at the end of the turn and uh, it will have temples which will score when uh, scoring uh, is given or they will uh, will be part of a region the region uh, same regions uh, connected regions uh, and uh, places north of the nile or south of the nile or in the same quadrant will score more points when you complete a set so basically this is the essence of the game at the end of the third turn if you have a full board, you will have scored all provinces. Or if you are playing in less than five players, there will be some provinces that will not be scored at all. And this is for phase one. Phase two is the market. You will buy powers, you will buy farmers, and you will buy resources. This is simple. You spend money and you buy stuff. You can buy uh, special powers which will allow you to uh, to either empower an action you do or to allow or allow you to ignore a rule for instance in bidding to rebid immediately or something like that after having purchased powers uh, you will purchase farmers that you place on your terrains to make more money at the end of the turn and after the having purchased uh, the workers you will purchase by, uh, the stones with the stones on your province you will build pyramids whenever there is exactly three stones on a single province that province will get the three stones removed and get a pyramid the pyramid scores points so uh, that's basically it there's a third phase which is offering that is another auction and it's a uh, it's a blind one when you do an offering, basically everyone offers an amount of money to Amore. 
when they when everyone has offered money the highest bidder gets uh, gets the most prizes and gets items and so on uh, down to the lowest bidder at this point uh, one or more of the players could decide to spend instead the one minus three the steel uh, card they got at the beginning of the game this is a special card they can play once and if they play this uh, uh, card they don't spend any money they don't receive any gift from Amore but they get back three uh, they get back three money from the treasury uh, so this may be a move to basically uh, not uh, Okay, uh, I have to explain this. Uh, all the money you offer gets to raise the level of the temple. When there are farmers on the on your fields, they gain money based on the number of the level of the temple. So level one, one money, one gold. To level two, two golds, and so on. Uh, this means that people, that players with a lot of provinces, with a lot of workers, will benefit by uh, from high offers, while uh, people with uh, the least amount of workers and so on will uh, not need, uh, we want to not have the level of the temple get raised that much. And uh, of course, whoever wins this bid will get first player the next turn, and being first player means that you will get uh, basically uh, the uh, to choose first, which is a lot in this kind of bidding games. At the end, there is a fourth phase, which is the harvest. Uh, you basically get uh, money from the you get money from your fields and uh, you get basically to build and construct everything. At the end of the fourth phase, uh, the turn begins anew until you have done three turns. When you have done three turns, you score. You score one point for each, uh, for each pyramid, you score uh, points for the temple level in the in provinces with the temple and then every province gets out to be bid again. All workers get away and the new kingdom starts exactly like in brass when you go to the railway era uh, at this point uh, the game will be exactly the same but this time the provinces will be seeded with the pyramids you built already so they will have already uh, their value worth in points and uh, then you start again, you play three other turns, and then you score points. That's basically it. Amore. <laughs> it's a game that I've seen uh, very often at the shop and never, never really picked up, but uh, it looks, it seems to be very, very interesting. Yeah. And both Amore and Ra are games I've owned in the past and I've let go. Um, and I think I might get Ra again after hearing Alessio talk about Amore. Yeah. <laughs> Not that Armour Ray's bad, it's just of the two, it seems that it's a much longer game to play, and I think for what I, my purpose is RAR or rather dice game, if I can find that, might do. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's very comparable to a game of Brass. Uh, actually, Brass Birmingham, I think uh, uh, a very fast game of Brass is like a normal game of Armour Ray, so a bit more than a one hour. So, uh, yeah, Ra is faster, and uh, actually Ra has a more interesting bidding, but it has only one turn of bidding, uh, and the set collection is all. Amore is a more complete game, where uh, actually you can uh, pursue a, a few different strategies. Now, uh, mm. they're also, um, it's, it's a good comparison, Brass, because both Brass and Ammon Ray seem to be about plying the um, working class or slave <laughs> class with alcohol while they build things for the ruling class. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that's uh, the, uh, well, in, in ancient Egypt, I have to say, you probably d didn't have that much choice of which class to be in. So, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, we don't have much choice these yeah, days. Yeah, not, not either. It. You need to yeah. get really lucky. So true. So, uh, Amore is actually a progenitor to a lot of interesting games, and uh, the parallel with Brass is very interesting because Brass is currently number one on BGG rankings, and deservedly so. So, uh, it shows how uh, a smart idea. Old Kingdom, New Kingdom, uh, Canal Era, Railroad Era, is basically uh, making the entirety of the game. The auction bidding is beautiful and allows for uh, player interaction, which is both direct and indirect. And uh, because you can uh, both interfere with, uh, interfere with the plans of your opponents, but you can also have them suicide themselves <laughs> if you really want. So it's... Uh, it's a pretty smart and interesting game, and actually, I think that the base game with the art from Vincent Dutre is uh, perfectly priced and at the steal. I think you can have the box for less than sixty for sixty euros. So uh, I got Kickstarter prices, so they don't really don't really apply. Uh, I know about the deluxified components. Uh, the uh, it must be said that the components in the base box, I have just the base box because I have already the original game, and the components are already a noticeable upgrade, and the deluxification of this game is simply beautiful. Uh, since there has been a 20th anniversary edition of Ra 2, but uh, again, be warned that Ra is just a bidding game, uh, with a collection of course, uh, but lots of fun. You can choose, uh, you can pick among uh, the Knizia game, basically, you prefer. Of course, uh, all bidding games are beautiful. I also like a lot I Society, although it's not in the top three or top four. So there is a lot of smart plays here, and that's why basically I recommend it. Actually, the best way to recommend this game is that uh, I actually bought it twice and that in 20 years I think I was very close to playing it every year. I think except the years I got married, I played it every year until today. So that's it. I, I don't know how many games uh, can boast uh, that record. Get Amore, right. or get Ra, or get whatever. Oh, uh, Knizia classics are classics. Well, thank you, Alessio. So, after that, we can talk about uh, Legendary Encounters Aliens uh, with Fen. Yeah, so, uh, I am a mild horror aficionado. Uh, more specifically, I'm a passive enjoyer. As in, I'll watch people who talk about horror films rather than watching horror films. However, Alien and The Thing are two of the best movies ever made, and I have many board games based on those two franchises. So, uh, Aliens... Sorry, let's give it its proper title, shall we? It's Legendary Encounters, a alien deck-building game. Because I don't know why they couldn't just call it Legendary Encounters Alien or Aliens, but uh, yeah. hey, there you go. So, it is a 1-5 to five player cooperative variant of the Legendary deck building game, which follows the same similar format as Ascension, um, which all derive kind of from Dominion. So the concept is you're building a deck, you start off with two types of cards that generate different forms of currency, and then you'll buy new cards, add them to your deck, evolve what your deck can do, and try and, in, normally in the other games, score points. But in Aliens, I'm going to call it Aliens for now, um, you are instead trying to survive a bunch of scenarios with other people. Uh, working together, you can play this solo. It scores very highly on the solo ratings, which is why I spent my time chasing up finding a copy. I did. I've got a very battered box secondhand. And um, I did manage to get the first expansion as well. That There was quite a few of those in stock around the place because it seems like um, there's more expansions than there are core games, I think. It's, it's a bit weird. Anyway, so you will start the game with a deck which has uh, seven of um, recruitment point generating cards and five attack 
generating cards. And you'll also have a role. Your role will give you one specific unique card to use. So you might be the gunner, you might be the technician, the medic, you might be the Wayland attorney executive. Boo! Um, anyway, so that will be your deck. So everyone will have more or less the same deck to start with. Uh, in addition, you have a number of life points because where's the tension if you can't die, you know? Uh, then um, on the table you'll have set up a three chapter um, story scenario uh, you can play them based on each of the movies so there's like Alien and Aliens, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection and there's even in the expansion some stuff based on I think it's comic book stories um, everything's got a really gorgeous comic book art style to it as well so it doesn't just look like movie stills it's uh, you know, illustrations of characters like Bishop and Hicks and so on um, and you will have in front of you a playmat which has a hive deck which is set up with a bunch it's like set up in acts so the most dangerous cards in for the third act at the bottom and then like the one above that will be the second and then the top will be first there's a few extra drones shuffled in depending on difficulty it turns out the drones tend to make the scenario a little easier um, and then you'll have a like a outline that tells you what you're trying to do and also lists hazards and each of the different um, objectives that you're trying to achieve will tell you what you need to do. And they'll also list what happens on events because they're like generic events that can pop up. And when they're revealed, you just do them. So um, what happens in your turn is, uh, sorry, there's another deck which contains a bunch of characters, a um, set number of them. It's all shuffled together and some of them are out in front of you and you can buy those characters. So on your turn, you'll draw a hive card and you'll put it face down in this track of locations that gradually head towards the combat zone. So you don't know what that card is at all. You've got no idea. Could be an alien, could be an event, could be an objective, could be Jonesy, the cat. I hope it's Jonesy. <laughs> so then on your turn, um, actual turn, you'll have a look at the cards you have in hand. Any attack cards you can spend to either attack things or to scan sectors. So each of the locations on the track the, the nearer you get to the hive deck the more expensive they are to scan you can scan them to flip them early and find out what's there and see if you can deal with it in advance um, otherwise you're just gonna have to let it get all the way to the combat zone and it might do things um, so this is part of the like good part of the attacking is you're not just mindlessly attacking stuff to kill it you're thinking about what do i need to scan sometimes the locations get modified by other cards so it's like oh it's useful for me to scan here because it's cheaper or um or not sometimes you scan things and they just sit there and they don't move alien eggs that's a classic obviously eggs famously don't move um so yeah, and then you'll spend your recruitment points on hopefully buying more cards that will go into your discard pile and you'll like get rid of all of that and draw a new hand when the deck's empty, shuffle up, draw again. That's pretty standard deck building stuff. I think everyone knows how a deck builder works these days. So let's talk about the really cool stuff. So first of all, if you let an alien get to the combat zone, they start attacking. And if they attack, you have to draw a strike card from the strike deck. And that has a bunch of different numbers in it. And you can get hit for nothing. It's just a scratch. It's just a flesh wound. That's no problem. Or you can get hit by a card that goes, hey, bad luck. You're going to have to draw a second strike card. And that one could deal you a ton of damage or just kill you outright. So you do not want to let the aliens get to the combat zone. But of course, when scanning, you might flip over vents and they, they can catch you off guard because they trigger immediately and they cause all sorts of issues that you have to deal with. So that's kind of frightening. But... I think maybe my favorite mechanic is the alien eggs. So when you find an egg, it stops moving on the track. So other things will skip past it because as I said, it's an egg and famously the only egg that moves is Humpty Dumpty and Dizzy. Um, uh, uh, so it sits there, but if you draw an event, it hatches. And what happens is then you have to discard the egg and put a face hugger in front of you. And You've got the rest of this turn and the next player's turn to deal with that face hugger. Otherwise, it jumps on you and becomes a chest burster, which is a chest burster card that's shuffled, it's put into your discard pile, and then it'll get shuffled into your deck in future shuffles. And as soon as you draw it, you're dead. You are that's, that's it. Per that's perfect as a mechanic. It is. Yeah. It's it's a really it's so tense and it's so, it encourages so much teamwork. 
and it is it, it, it's really interesting to have that sensation of like there is a chest burster in this deck and I'm trying to eliminate cards off the top of my deck but if I don't manage to hit it I'm history and everyone's gonna have to carry on without me and that is really like it's it's the first time in a long time I actually felt genuine dread when drawing or playing a board game of any kind actually like oh my god I, I don't want to have to draw any cards I'm not playing anything that draws more cards um, it's it's fantastic um, then there's also I as mentioned the strike mechanic um, there's also really cool contextual stuff like certain locations do specific things like at the end of the very first uh, scenario based on alien you have to get the perfect organism into the airlock location and like open the airlock with enough resources and shove it out there and that's the only way you can win and you can't kill it otherwise because that's Quite what fun. happened yeah, it is um, it is super, super thematic. It's so unbelievably um, like perfect for what the game is. And I, I really enjoy it. And I think a co-op game should be hard. This is really, really hard. Maybe you'll get a 20, 25% win rate. But for me, that's cool because it means I'm not going to get bored of this game. I know sometimes I'm going to sit down and it's going to go horribly wrong. Like my first ever game where I died to a um, chest burster in three turns. Um, which is really unfortunate, you know. It's like, oh, here's a chest burster. <laughs> oh, I just scanned it, so I don't have any attack cards left. Oh, and the next player doesn't have any attack cards in their hand. <laughs> oh, goodness me. I've got one card that removes cards from my deck. Is it going to work? No, I drew the chest burster first, and you've got to finish this entire mission all by yourself, which is still, it basically resulted in both of us putting our heads together to try and pilot one character through the scenario. Um actually resulted in a victory but it was really really close so that's just fantastic i um really can't recommend this enough for a cinematic aliens themed feeling i think i think i prefer it over the aliens um board game which is the i think it's gale force board game with the plastic miniatures that's really hard and really fun as well um but this Mm. In terms of preference, how would you uh, put it compared to Nemesis, which is definitely not an alien game, definitely yeah. not. Legally distinct. Legally, yeah, legally distinct. It's a complete uh, new creation. I would, I would, um, I pick this. They, though, I was going to get onto it, but Legendary's um, main issue is setup because you have to set up the scenario, you have to set up the deck for the hive deck, correct? Yeah. You have to set up the character deck. Everyone has to set up their own decks. Uh, you need to keep everything super organized with its dividers, otherwise you're going to like get really mixed up. Um, Makes sense. But you can play a game of this within an hour, and if somebody dies, uh, it doesn't feel bad to sit out because you're still working with everyone else. Um, yeah. So I I thought I think of the, I think this is better than Nemesis for sure. I still love Nemesis. It's like a big oh, mess of a, a hot yeah. mess of a movie game. But this is really tight. All, all the mechanics feed into each other really well. Uh, I will say there is a co op, uh, a competitive mode where you can play as traitors. Um, so, you know, like Burke betrays everyone. Yeah, yeah, Spoilers like, for aliens, guys. It, Burke, the company man, is a bad guy. Who thought it? it? Any single uh, android is always someone that you should look at with a. Sorry, a replicant? No, what's the name for? Uh, the, um, no, it's. Um, uh, they are androids, yeah. Androids, Android, yeah. yeah. Uh, any single androids need to be looked with a very suspicious eye at all time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, except for Bishop. Poor except Bishop. except for Bishop, but Bishop yeah. betrays his programming. Um, no, he's no, just he doesn't. A good egg. He, he, he doesn't betray his programming. I'm pretty sure his, his orders are to uh, be an he, asshole and just... No, 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 that's the whole point. He's, he's specifically not an asshole because he's, he's an inversion of the previous android, Ash. Ah, all right. Ripley doesn't trust him at all, but he's yeah. he, he's like I think he's even programmed to give his life um, in exchange for humans. Uh, I, I, regardless, Bishop's cool it's guy. Ash yes. isn't. Bishop yeah. is great. Yes, <laughs> um, but there, there's so there's a traitor mode which I've, yeah. I don't think I'm ever going to get around to playing because heck, this game is hard enough without somebody trying to achieve uh, objectives that mess everyone else up. But that's nice to have the option. I also picked up the first expansion, which is just, I think, called Alien Expansion, something like that. Yeah. It has a whole separate board for a player who can play as the Alien Queen. And I don't want to play against the Alien Queen in a game where the rulebook goes, hey, by the way, if you play with the Alien Queen, you're probably not going to win. So just see how far <laughs> you can get, because they're going to wreck you. And I'm like, 
Okay, all right, I'll stick with my solo and co-op version, thank you very much. The Alien Queen's bad enough in the Alien story. So, um, yeah, that's, it's a fantastic game. And I don't know where it is with a licensing issue because it appears to have disappeared from being printed. Um, there was a Covenant-based expansion printed in 2019. I haven't managed to get that, it's super rare. Um, and uh, it's a bit of a shame. Uh, there are other Legendary Encounters games. There's X Files one is still in print, um, so and I think there's a Predator one, um, as well. Yeah, that's uh, which does have one. crossover crossover potential with um, Legendary Aliens, of course, because that's AVP is a hot mess. Yeah, it is. It's fun. These all apparently crossover with all of the um, like normal Legendary stuff. There's rules for it. It's you could play as superheroes versus aliens, I guess, if you wanted to. That's happened before. I think. Yeah, so anyway, um, I said I'd wrap it up and be quick. This is my recommendation. If you see this kicking around on the secondary market for a decent price, seriously consider picking it up because it is just a perfect translation of a theme into mechanics and it is amazing that Upper Deck managed to translate their semi-co-op deck builder into such a rich expression of this feels like playing aliens and i don't even mind that it is brutal and hard and cruel because that's the way that universe is and is that beautiful playmat i see included in the game the neoprene playmats yes they yeah are. Yep. <laughs> wonderful yep yep it's it's um it's it's a pretty nicely put together production i say the main issues are the dividers you have to hand write them they're not great and there is a lot of setup and also i can't sleeve every single card and keep it all in the core box um but uh, this cards i don't have sleeved are for the traitor and alien queen and alien player modes where there's a mode if you die then you could play as an alien um just to make sure everyone else dies really yeah. quickly. Which is, I, think, I think it's a nice touch to get you can be like okay if someone dies they get to play as the bad guy which is it's cool but yeah uh, that's usually a good way to keep people playing uh, it is. And not feel too bad about uh, dying yeah but anyway that's it and if you can't get it campaign up a deck to reprint this game because it needs to be reprinted because it is the best movie tying i've played since big trouble in little china you mentioned that you quite like horror game i'm starting to wonder if you like deck building game too I do. I love deck building games. I love card games. I love shuffling cards. I play Kingdom Death because I like shuffling hit location decks. That's it. That's it. I like shuffling decks. I like shuffling decks and I like playing card games. I'm, a, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an ex semi pro magic player. What do you expect? <laughs> there are a lot of most flourish when shuffling, so yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's about all of the time that we, we have today. Uh, you can catch us over at Patreon uh, slash the last um, and we are not yet on Blue Sky, but maybe we, we should get in onto that. So until next time, we have been the last ND. It's going to be a goodbye from Alessio. Goodbye from Fan. In space, no one can hear you say. <laughs> And myself, but remember that the last, uh, e, that the second E in Standy stands for Encounter? Have we done that one? We've probably done that one. Let's just do it anyway. Encounter, encounter, encounter. Yeah. Encounter. <laughs>